So, welcome to another Wargame review from theplayersaid.com. My name is Alexander, and today we're taking a look at a solitaire game, primarily, um, called Skies Above the Reich, and this is from GMT Games, came out quite recently. Um, it's designed by Jerry White, but it was not just him. Let me just get it right. And Mark... Asted is how I'm going to pronounce it. Probably wrong. I apologize. Um, if you know anything about Jerry White, uh, he's designed quite a few uh, air war games, quite a few solitaire games. If you know the, the Enemy Coast Ahead series, he did the Doolittle Raid and the original one, the Dambuster Raid. Um, so if you've played those, you'd be familiar with um, at least the way that the rulebook's written and laid out and the type of experience you might get in the box. Um, you get a lot of the similar um, kind of feel from how to learn the game. A lot of the rules, there's, there's a lot of rules. If you watch the unboxing, it, it, you know, the, the rule book is huge, but the text is very big. There's actually not many rules per page, and a lot of it is just examples of like how to do it. So there's, if you actually condense this into like a Avalon Hill style pure text, it actually wouldn't be a very big rule book. Um, and basically, the the game is laid out such that there's these two or three play aid cards, and it says, "Here's how to set up a campaign and a mission, and then go to the card and start playing." Here's a really here's a sequence of play that's detailed. It's got a summary of what all that stuff means. And if you need clarification, here's the page to look in the rulebook. So you learn it as you go, and I recommend doing that. Just kind of set up the game, follow the instructions. You don't really need to read the rule book before you start playing this one. You read it as you go, and I felt like that was the easiest way to learn this game. You could sit and plow through the rules and watch the examples. You could do that in a traditional way, but it's set up so where you can just jump kind of into it. And the first game will be a mess, and it's, a lot of it happens, and you're like, oh, okay, that's how that works. But this style of game um, lends itself to that. So what do I mean by that? If, you, if you've ever played um, Target for Today um, from Legion War Games or the original B-17 Queen of the Skies, old Avalon Hill game, um, you know, you play as, uh, you're a B-17 and you control the crew and it's, you know, navigating, of trying to avoid flak, um, you might get attacked by some fighters trying to pick your gun positions and shoot them down. It's a lot of dice rolling, it's quite random, and it's a story-driven, narrative-based game. You know, that's why you don't play that for, like, the tactical prowess. You just play it for, like, the cool, crazy things that happen to you, and can you get your guys through a campaign? Can they survive? Um, this game, Skies Above the Reich, is the opposite of that, from a thematic standpoint. The game style is very similar, but in this one, the board, and I, I'll show you here in a bit, the board is a formation of B-17s, and you play as the interceptors. So you start with a squadron, or a shuffle as they call it, of, of uh, Messerschmitt BF-109s, and, it, you know, you are using however many you're allotted for that mission. You're literally flying them, dodging and weaving between uh, planes in a formation. You're doing the attacking, and trying not to get shot down. So you get a lot of that randomness, very much akin to um, Silent Victory is, is in that vein as well, I, I believe. And even to an extent, some of the DVG leader series where you don't have a lot of control over the outside events, you have control over how you react to them. This is similar, right? It's a story-based. But what I really, really enjoyed about this is that you do have I think you have a large element of control here because you get to position your fighters where they attack from um, and then when they attack you assign a maneuver to them so you might approach from an oblique angle and you might come from high or low um, then you might do your attacks and the cards are going to kind of determine randomly what happens do you hit, do you miss, do you run out of ammo how far do you, you might move through them as part of the attack, you might fly past them kind of thing. But then you've assigned a maneuver, so after you've done your attack run, do you climb and go straight 
in which case you'd attack from the opposite side of the board next time. You kind of fly and do a loop and come back. Or do you do you do a roll? So do you attack from the side and do you roll and go towards the tail end of the formation so you would attack from the back next time? And, and again, I'll show you that. So you've got a bit of tactical control of, okay, how can I maximize my advantages? And that's something else that we'll come to here in a bit. Um, you have advantages when you attack. So you can try and set yourself up to give yourself the best possible attacks. Still, still decided by random cards. Um, but you can, you can mitigate oh, some of the randomness at least. Or at least put yourself in a position to where the randomness doesn't kill you. Now, I keep saying the word random. There's a lot of it, okay? There's a lot of dice rolling to determine the mission type, the mission formation, how many op points you have to spend, so how, which is basically how many planes you can buy to use. Um, you roll for the position of the sun, which is random. Obviously, you want to attack out of the sun, usually a good thing. You know, if you get hit and you get wounds, you chuck dice to see how bad the damage is. Do you blow up? Do you crash land? Do you bail out? If you bail out, do you survive? You know, the, you know the, all, the ton of stuff. Uh, so there's all in And then when you do the attacks, the attack resolution is by cards, which I really like. Uh, it actually, flipping the cards in this way gives me a little bit of the same feeling of... Um, the Battle of Britain, 1940, from from uh, from Decision Games. It, it's really actually entirely different, but I enjoy having a card, say, here's, you pull a card and it's like a grid, and it's like, you attacked at this angle, it was this kind of a lethality, this is how much fire was leveled at you, here's what happens, and it's kind of a cross grid. So, whilst the, I think a deck of card is, I don't I, I probably should know, it's probably 20, 25, 30 cards, it's not very many. It at least doesn't feel like it's very many, but there's so, there's so many iterations on that card that you might pull the same card twice, but you'd never know it, because you'd attack from a different angle, different elevation, different lethality. Again, we'll get to that lethality here in a second. So it's, it's really neat how the system works. It's very, very easy. You just kind of move your fighters in, and then they attack. So you pull these cards and the card says you hit, you miss, you or you might take a damage, um, it might move you a space forward, you kind of like, you attack and you fly through them, or if you're attacking from the tail, you might just stay level with them, you might just attack, 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 and you don't move. Something I noticed when you attack from the rear, you don't fly past them, you can sit on their tail and gun them down. Um, and, and that way you can keep protected from continuing fire, which is another aspect I thought was really cool. You do all your attacks, and how they resolve the attack back is through a continuing fire deck. Literally, you, you do your attacks, resolve those, and then you pull a, an attack back on you is effectively what it is. And a lot of them have um, kind of a, an event text that says, you know, if, these, if this stipulation is met, here's this extra crazy thing that happens, or... And it might be, you don't take any fire, things like that. And then there's a grid where it says, if you're attacking and it's you're in a certain type of space, here's what happens to you. You might take return fire, things like that. So all in all, it's a really cool game. Uh, I've played a bunch of missions. The one, the one thing I will say about this, and I don't know if it's that I'm really bad at it, it's very, very hard. <laughs> Which I think, I think might be me just being really bad at it. Um, I, you know, it, it can turn on a dime. And so, and at first I was like, oh, this is, you know, it's, I've got a control of the squadron, it's a little bit tactical, like, why am I doing so badly? And I had to take a step back and realize, you know, this is, it, I don't think they can legally call it that, but this is the, it's the counterpart to that Target for Today B-17 style game. And I'm like, no, it's... It's the randomness. There's so much randomness. You can do all you want, but you'll still have to, like, roll a dice. And my dice rolling or my card pulling always comes up with the worst events. I think I was I was plugging through... I was I did a 1942 campaign. Kind of the first campaign, six missions long. And you have to accrue, like, I think 10, 15 victory points, something like that, over the course of six missions. And you basically get one victory point for every bomber you destroy. If it's if it's an inbound mission, you get two for each one you destroy because they don't make it to the bombs. 
but if it's near the target or outbound, basically it's 1vp for all the, all the bombers that you destroy, um, or that fall out of formation and kind of crash, things like that. So, in the very first mission, I lost two fighters. It was, it was a disaster. Because over a six course campaign, you can lose a maximum of six fighters. And I'd lost a third of them in the first mission. <laughs> it's just an indication of how, how badly you do. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of show you how that worked, because it was very, very interesting. There's always opportunities for bad things to not happen to you. Again, it's some random die rolling. There's some chip pulls for the damage. And then you roll on the chit to see if that damage sticks with you. And of course, it would stick with me all the time. And then, uh, and then there's like these fake boxes. So if you take wing damage and that damage sticks with you, um, basically you go to the fake box and you're done for the mission. At the end of the mission, you roll everyone who's in a fake box. So you roll to see um, what happens. Do they land? Do they crash? Did that damage cause a fire? Did the plane just explode? And then, depending on what happens with that, you roll to see, you know, if you crashed, did you, were you able to bail out? Yes or no? No, I didn't bail out, you just die, and your pilot's dead, and you cross him off your squadron list, and you, you hopefully, you enlist a green pilot, who are not good. The green pilots have these really cool uh, penalties, and some of the penalties are like, what you'd expect. Oh, they're not very good. But one of the penalties I really enjoyed was zeal, where they're like too good. They're like they they won't they won't fly carefully or evasively. They'll only go like full throttle and attack, attack, attack. So it, which makes them much more susceptible to taking return fire and damage. It don't, it, so it's really cool um, how that whole system works. And, and you have your kind of standard campaign that you'd expect. You got a sheet with your squadron on it, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, they, they gain experience points, they can gain these kind of expert traits which can do more damage or help them avoid damage or a lot of different things that they can do. Um, so that, that's, that's a really neat aspect. I think what I'll do, enough for me, I'm going to kind of show you the board and we'll kind of take a look at what everything kind of looks like and, and how it works. And then we'll kind of come back for, for some final thoughts. So uh, here's a look at the map. Um, this is just one of two maps. This is the small map one. This is also double-sided with another formation on the back. And there's a map that's twice the size of this with twice as much stuff on it that's also double-sided that you'll use in the later war. This is kind of 1942 early war um, where the formations weren't as good or as big. Uh, so that, that's kind of what, what you're dealing with here. Um, Basically, a mission starts with a bunch of charts that you roll through, and again, the sequences of play are really good. So this is the mission sequence of play, but to start with the setup, not the advanced game, you have like the campaign setup here, you've got mission setup, and it leads you through all the stuff you need to do, and then you resolve the mission. Basically, to choose the mission, you roll on this table, so we're doing a 1942 campaign, you roll a d10, it tells you what map to do. Then you roll another d10, it tells you what type of mission on that map. And then you roll another d10. Say we're doing an inbound mission. I roll a d10, this is how many ops I get. You want to roll high, you want to have lots of ops. That means you can, or OPs. That means operation, there's operation points. And that means you can buy more guys. If you have a low number, you're going to be flying with two 109s. That's not good. <laughs> you're hard to do a lot of damage with that. And then you've got a roll on this table that tells you the level of um, kind of escorts that they're going to have and um, um, what type of escorts. There's a few different types in the mission that I played down here. You can see I've got these Spitfire, Spitfire counters. Um, and there was like five of them because there's not many. You can have up to seven if you've got really heavy escorts. And those are there to kind of gum up these movement tracks and they attack you as well if you end up uh, in the same space as them. Um, but that's, that's a lot of what that is, and you literally then, once you've set everything up, you spend all your money, you can buy these blocks, so this is, you have the guys in your squadron, so I have, let's take a little look, that squadron thing, I heard is, there's a lot, kind of, not a lot of paper, here's my squadron uh, roster, um, you have all these guys, and you're, 
spending ups to bring that many out onto the board. Um, so I've, I've got all these guys up here. Some of these start with some skills, uh, which are nice. But you're spending, you know, if I've got four ops, I can bring on one, uh, 109 costs one up. So I'm going to spend one to bring one on. So if you can spend four, you bring, you can have four planes flying a little mission. And as you'll see here, you've got um, a larger number of ops as you go on through through the various campaigns into into later type stuff. So you can end up with like 20 ops. And if you looked on the pilot roster, it's hard to spend 20 on 109s, but what you can do is you can buy um, kind of support fighters. They're not part of your squadron, but you can buy in like Youngers 88s, big 110, well 110s, there's Fuck Wolves, there's a bunch of stuff that you can kind of buy in extra to supplement your fighters and kind of have at them. And when you start getting into the big huge maps, you'll need that firepower. But really, like a lot of Jerry White's games, like I said, you just then follow, you can just follow the play aids. You have a move section, or you put them on in the first turn, and then you just follow here what it says. And it's interesting, um, moving, when they say move, what they're saying is they're moving between boxes here. So if you're in a low box, you can either move up to a different altitude, or you can move into this approach box. And they're all linked by arrows here, and each of them has this a little TP, uh, tactical point value. A lot of it's zero. If you're ever moving level or moving down, it's always zero, basically. But if I want to climb from low to high, I have to spend one of my precious tactical points. Now on a chart here, you roll uh, at the beginning of the mission to see how many tactical points you have. So you might only have two, in which case you're just limited tactically to how much extra stuff you can do. Uh, because being able to just move a stack Let's say we had a couple guys here. Say we had three dudes here. It costs one TP to move any number of guys from one box upwards. So we can move them all into this high box. That's great. Um, or if you only had one dude, that would still cost one TP to move just one. So if you can get big stacks and, and maximize your tactical point spending, that's really nice as well. But moving, like I said, it's just moving between these boxes. You have this move section. You want to move out into the approach boxes, because that means you get to attack. Um, after you do that, um, but you don't attack immediately. So you move out on here, and then what happens uh, is you then... some If you have fighters you don't want to attack with, maybe they're damaged, or maybe they have... Um, if they have like a jam counter on them, or they might not have any ammo, they might run out of ammo, which is, comes from the CRTs. Um, you might just say, oh, they'll fly home, they're not going to participate in the attack anymore. Um, then you roll for these escorts, and it's kind of hard to see, but there's some charts here, and there's some different stations where the escorts might be. So basically, you usually start with your stack of escorts in, in one of these boxes. There's three, kind of off map here. Say they start all in the forward. And what you do is you would roll a dice and consult the dice. This is an eight on the forward chart table. This says below trailing. So what happens is, is one of these fighters moves from this box to this box. That doesn't really affect the game right now, but what's going to happen is next turn, that's this is turn one for example, on turn two, I'm going to roll on this forward chart to move one of these again. He might say, if he rolled a five, he might go to nose level. So he's going to come onto the nose side over here into this level box. Again, that's kind of off camera there. He's gonna be on the board where he can affect the play. Because I've got guys in this box, in this holding box down here, I'm also gonna roll on this chart. And I roll a six, so he's gonna go flank level eight to 10. So he's gonna go all the way to this flank in the level eight to 10, which is, we kind of can't really see it. I actually already have escorts down here. He's gonna join these guys. It wouldn't be there, but and what this does is, if I have fighters that move through here or next to here, he's going to jump on them and attack them. Um, so that can get pretty nasty before they can even start attacking the fighters. And it's kind of an abstracted way to, to do um, kind of escort fighter to fighter combat. And this came, the rule book is like, do not attack the fighters. You can't actively go and attack fighters, not allowed to, um, at least off map. You're here to kill the bombers. 
You might destroy fighters or make them peel off from doing attacks in these boxes, but you're here to kill the bombers. Kill the bombers. That's where the VPs are. Don't get any VPs for killing a ton of escorts. That's not the mission objective. So, um, movement is between boxes or entities approach boxes, like I said. If you've got guys that are damaged, they have these damage counters on them. Oh, that's upside down. So, a wing. For example, if this guy, well, that wouldn't happen. Because if you have a damage counter on him, for example, you resolve those now. So you don't resolve those immediately when you are damaged. They kind of, you fly, attack, you get damaged, you kind of peel off into this box over here. I'm going to roll a 7 or higher. Greater than or equal to, nothing happens. So I roll a 1, that's devastating. Which means this... So when the damage counter goes off, uh, like that, it, 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 we got damaged, it's very bad. What happens is, is he's no longer in the game, and he goes over onto one of these charts, and you notice the damage said it had, a, had the word wing on it. That's wing. So he's going to go into this fate box. And he stays in there until the very end of the mission. And we don't know what's going to happen to him. So that's, it's pretty interesting that way. And basically at the end of the mission, you're going to roll on these charts to see... Did he actually make it home? I have no idea. Um, and that's where a lot of you... If you've got bad dice rolling, a lot of guys are going to die from that. Um, combat, though, is, in, is resolved. Basically, what happens is... Uh, if you've got flak, you would do flak at this point, which is rolling on some charts and bits and pieces. Um, you do your attack. So anyone in an approach box gets to approach, and we'll do this formation. This is a special map. This is formation B, and this is formation A. It's actually kind of two maps on one. Very small, very early war stuff. So we'll just do this one here. You basically get to approach, because I'm coming from the tail, and I'm coming from tail low. Um, I'm going to approach the tail of any one of these bombers that I choose to. And low is denoted by not having an altitude block. So altitude blocks are these blue blocks. If I have one underneath me, I would do that if I had come from this level approach box, and from high, as you can imagine, I have two blue boxes underneath me. And that's just kind of an abstraction of altitude. And you can have a bunch of guys stacked on here if you had a bunch of guys coming out of the same box. Ideally, you'd like to get guys coming out of this high box, because it has this sun counter attached to it. And the sun counter enables you to, under certain circumstances, um, negate damage that's done to you. Because harder for the gunners to see you because you're coming out of the sun. So, get rid of those. I'm just going to attack this bomber in the back, and I'm going to do that, because if you look at these numbers in these spaces, this has a 1. A 1 is basically how, is like how lethal the box is. So, not particularly lethal, so I'm going to go for it here. And there's a lot of tactics in how you approach things. When you've got a bunch of guys, um, you know, you might put a bunch of dudes in here to all attack one space, but when you've got a bunch of guys like this, you have to roll a special check to see, because it's kind of, everyone's crammed in as a lot of fighters to see if either one of you collides with the bomber or collides with each other, kind of see what happens. Um, but you want to generally have a good amount of guys trying to get into the non-lethal boxes and attack from some different angles and altitudes. And that helps you to get some of these position advantages. Or if you want to all attack out of one side with a big swarm coming from the back, you can get this um, swarm advantage, which helps you do more damage. So th there's, there's a few different nuances to how you move, but it was kind of weird at first because you just go from this box and you say, I'm going to attack this bomber. And you just move to behind it, basically. You don't move through these spaces or anything like that initially. You just assign them. Boop. So if I've got a guy coming out of this um, high flank box, he's gonna just go, uh, I wanna attack this guy up here, again, because he's got that one lethality. I put him up here, and because he came out of the high box, I put that, those two blocks underneath him. And you kind of point the fighter towards the bomber they're attacking, so that if you have a guy in here, you know, is he attacking this bomber, is he attacking this bomber, that's how you know. Um, combat resolution is pretty simple. Um, you would just flip a card. So we're attacking from the tail, so as you can see up here there's a bunch of cards, we're gonna flip a tail card. And the tail card, remember we're in this one lethality box here, 
So we're going to look into the one column and we're attacking from low and do you do either gray or blue? And that's determined by the, which side of your block is showing. This would be the gray or the determined side. The reverse side is evasive and it's light blue. And that's the same on all of the planes. So that would be this kind of bottom blue one. We would have a blank. So we would neither take damage or do damage. Instead, we look in this gray box here and we crosshairs do a damage, explosion take a damage. Or a hit, I guess. So we're going to do that. So to deal a damage, you pull a chip from the from here. Da, 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 and we pulled. Ooh, what do we got? Oh, upside down. We have engine. And this this number on here is a catastrophic event, which might be triggered. So we kind of put that down here, and we resolve it immediately. And to do that, we're trying to roll equal to or higher than this number, which was an eight. So let's see if we can do it. We do not. So what would happen in this instance is we would just flip it over to the damage side, which is a zero. So we didn't do any damage. That's actually pretty lame. If, for example, I had rolled an eight or a nine or a 10, this catastrophic trigger would go off. The damage is kind of discarded, but the bomber immediately falls out of the sky and out of the formation. That's what that down arrow was is the bomber falling out of the formation and crashing. Um, in this instance, the wing one here, this has an explosion on it. The bomber would explode, and that means it's destroyed. In game, those have the same effect, this negative one. But in certain missions, destroyed bombers are worth more than fallen bombers uh, for, for victory point standpoint. So this is good, you know, if we'd gotten that to go off. If we don't, and we're stuck with that zero damage, that is frankly terrible. Um, because it takes a combination of 10 damage points from these counters to take a bomber out. So if you look here, well, it's going to take us every single one of these counters to get to 10. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 hits. 7 hits. And if you've only got two or three fighters, that's it's almost impossible to do. So the game be very, very difficult in that way. So that's why you want to try and get the advantages to help you do more damage. When your pilots gain a lot of experience, they gain like expert traits where you can also try to accumulate damage with some of those traits. Some traits help you avoid damage, but that's kind of part of the game. You get to choose what you want, or you can do that randomly up to you. Um, but that's basically how that goes. Now, it, for example, if you were attacking from an oblique angle, there's a little bit different here. If you look, a lot of these oblique ones, you know, the same results on either side, but they have that, that little white number in the middle of a result. So, for example, we're attacking in a two lethality box, because again, there's crossfire from the tail gunner here and the waist gunner here. So you look under the two column, we were coming from, let's say, uh, a low elevation, a low uh, altitude, and we're no two, so low altitude, and we're determined this is this is a very interesting result. So the crosshair is we do a damage. So again, we take a damage chip and resolve that. There's a one here, that white one, like there's a number in a lot of these, and then also no ammo. No ammo is bad. You get a no ammo counter, basically means he runs out of ammo. He wasted all of his ammo doing that hit. And he's basically combat ineffective. He's, a, he's one where he's going to fly off the board and you're going to say, go home. And he's just going to exit and just leave the mission because he can't do any more damage. Um, but this one here, all these white numbers are kind of uh, what's referred to as pass through. And it's basically you, it's you continuing to fly. Um, so he basically would move an extra space. And that only is important for the continuing fire, which are these blue cards up here. And continuing fire is the bombers returning fire on you actively. And so, which space do you move to? Well, before we do our attack, what you do is you choose one of these maneuvers to do. So there's either basic diving and climbing, which means you will move. So, for example, in this one, he came out of this side, he's just going to move to the opposite track and end up on this track, and then in a subsequent turn, he's going to fly back this way. 
and climbing and diving refers to which side of the track he's going to go on to. And thus, so obviously, if you climb, you'll go onto this side and you'll return into this high box. So you can attack from a high altitude again. If you dive, you'll go to the low box here and attack from a low altitude next time. Or these all have a reverse side, which is a roll. And as you can imagine, it goes to either side, again, climbing or diving. So for this example, if he was diving and going straight forward, that one we saw on that results card moves us here. If he was rolling, you get to choose which direction to point that arrow. He would move either here or here. And that's really important because if I end up moving here, that return fire is going to be on a one box. If I move here, same thing. If I was rolling and I ended up moving here, on the continuing fire, I'm going to take some a two column on the continuing fire, which is not good. So let's do that. We'll just pull the continuing fire. First thing you do is read and do the text, pull away. If climbing or climb rolling, draw another card. Ignore its event text, but apply hits from both cards. Very, very bad. Luckily, we're diving. We're doing a dive roll, so we don't have to do that text, so that's nice. But we look at the two chart, and we're determined or evasive again, gray or blue. We were determined, so we're going to take a hit. And this, if you look, on the one chart, nothing. So if we'd have ended up going to one of these two spaces, we wouldn't have taken the damage. But we're going to take a damage as a result. And a damage is, again, chosen randomly, and you just put it out, and it's a fuel six. So that's a little bit easier to get out of, but again, during the next turn, you everyone kind of moves. Guys with damage don't move, because they might not even make it back onto the board like this guy didn't. Um, you would roll later on in, the, in a subsequent turn for this uh, to, to see if he makes it back onto the board. He might get rid of it and come back, but it takes time to, for that to happen. So, because he rolled this way, he's going to go off the board all the way over here into the low box, which again, you can't really see. So we'll just kind of pop it over there. And he's got that six fuel damage on him. And then you would do a new turn. So you've got a turn chart, a turn marker that's going to go through these turns. You have a flight limit, again, that's rolled randomly. Um, your escorts are going to have more turns. And you just do that over and over again. It's flying, going, finding good attack vectors, and then cycling your fighters through these boxes, which take a little bit to get used to, but it's really, really interesting how that all uh, comes together. Thought it was very cool. Um, and it took, it, I, I had to take a couple games to be like, okay, if I fly high over here and low over here, what's that gonna end like? Oh, I took a damage. Because when you take a damage, um, this becomes very important, the sequence of play. So you move, but um, fighters with a hit marker on them uh, don't move. Fighters with hit markers may not move. So this guy with the, with the fuel hit marker on him, let's pretend he doesn't have the low. So he has a hit marker on him. When you leave the board, you know, you fly off at the end of that combat round. If you were on your evasive side, you would go to this evasive box, which delays you a whole extra turn. If you're on your um, determined side, you go to this normal return box here, right? But normally, so if these guys are here together, this dude, he gets to move immediately. He doesn't. He has to spend basically this whole turn doing this recovery. So he rolls this recovery, he rolled a six, equal to or greater than, that's great, this goes away, that's nice. But, the, but that's all the way down here, he doesn't get to move again until next turn. So the damage is really important um, to try and keep cohesion and keep your fighters cycling and if you need to keep them in groups so you can maximize damage. And that's why you want to attack from a bunch of different angles and have a, guys coming from everywhere or try and group them and swarm all in one go. I, there's just, there's a lot here. Um, and basically you get hit, you get victory points for bombers that have fallen, bombers that are damaged. Um, once every turn, basically you roll a, D, a D10 and you're trying to roll less than the number of markers on, on the element, so to speak. So there's one, two, three. Oh look, I rolled a two. Well, that's an unbelievable roll. Basically what happens is, is the element becomes loose. 
which means every lethality space is negative one. So it's really easy to attack them. And it's really easy to attack back here. So each of these spaces is now a one, because look, they're all twos. They're all negative one, so they're all ones. And these two back here, because they were adjacent to this bomber, these have another negative one. So these are zero spaces to attack this guy. Well, we definitely want to do that, because if you kind of look here, when you're attacking on the zeros, like, there, there's so many hits and so few times you take damage. So you want to try and kill a bunch of guys and then attack the weak spots and keep laying at home. And the more damage you put out, the more... So this might flip, and this might go to the element kaput side, which is a negative two to all these. And then you just r kind of lay the pain on. So once you can start doing the damage, the game becomes easier. But you have to get in, do it quick, and then clean up your mess. And, and that's something that I love about this game. Um, it can be very punishing if you don't do a lot of damage. It's really hard to break up the formations. Um, and unlucky rolls and unlucky card draws can hose you pretty quickly, but resolving a mission takes really 20 minutes, 25 minutes, once you know what you're doing. Um, some of the longer missions, maybe, maybe half hour, 35 minutes. It's solo. You take your time, you do what you want. Uh, but that's kind of a brief look at the board. There's there's a lot more to it. There's an advanced game which has extra um, kind of pursuit cards and things like that. But this is really a lot of what it is. It's moving guys around. You move them on the tracks and then you fly out and attack and it's, and it's awesome. So what we'll do is we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. So that was a look at the board and kind of how the game works briefly. There's a bit more to it. Um, there's like a whole advanced game which adds some very familiar looking um, mechanics that you that you know you have a big B17 with lots of attack things. You actively do that. That looks very very similar um, to Target for today and B17, but that's kind of all added on. You don't necessarily need to do that. Um, there is a two player option as well, which is neat. It's two player co op. Uh, I would think I would play it as pure co-op just because it's I'm just here to have fun, but you can you can do it as um, uh, Two player like semi co-op so you would accrue points over the campaign You've got to win the campaign, but who won the most victory points was kind of the better the better squadron leader and that they they kind of there's extra rules as to who gets what and how many people control what things Which was cool that it wasn't just divide everything in half. They don't do that um, you get, there's like an extra buffer of things, so everyone's got a good amount, and everyone can do a decent amount of damage. Uh, so I thought that was neat that it wasn't just a straight cut the forces in half and you get half of them. Which is sometimes a little bit corny when you've like, this is a solo game, but we're making it two player by splitting everything in half. That just, sometimes that feels a little bit flat, and I, di I didn't feel this way with this one. They, they built a little bit more into that point by system, so everyone has... It's more than just cutting everything in half, which I thought was very, very cool. And there's like, you get penalties. So if you were to buy in a lot of those, um, like all the extra fighters, if you get in ME 110s and things like that, when you lose a lot of those, you take significant penalties. Because, you know, the, the, I guess, I don't, the commander, it gets upset because you've wasted all of his extra resources that he had to requisition from wherever else. But I, it, it's cool how that works too. So all, all in all, campaign is fun. It's nice. It's 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 what you'd expect um, from a game like this. You know, it's accruing victory points for destroying things. Try to kill the enemy. Try not to die. So it's simple in that way. Um, if you watch the unboxing, a lot of card and paper in this game. Really not that intimidating. It's kind of uh, Jerry White's M.O. It's how he makes the game. And having played a few of them, I'm used to it. I like it a lot. I enjoy being able to just pick up the played cards and set it up and play it. And have to, and then reference the rulebook as I go, which you don't actually have to do very often. Um, I thought that was cool. The play aids are incredibly detailed and good. Once you've played two or three missions, you don't need the rulebook. This huge rulebook, which is beautiful and nice and the most well-produced rulebook, ever. It's insane. It, you could just put it in the box and never look at it again, because uh, the rules are not complex. It's fairly rules light. Um, I don't know what they say on the scale. 
five. Yeah, no. I, this to me is less than a five. When you actually play it and you've played it a couple times, so simple to play. And I think that's a, uh, a great, uh, I think that's a big positive for the game. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Com the components are off the chart. You know, there's a ton of cards, and the cards are functional in what they do. You get all these blocks, ton of uh, damage counters, and a good number of um, administrative counters, and those escort counters we looked at, the nice big one-inch ones. All the good play aids. You don't get just this board, like I said, you get the huge, normal 17x24 board as well, 24x32. No. The big, huge board that's twice as big as this one, again, also double-sided. So there's four different boards that you can play on, um, and it, it just means there's endless amounts of iterations of things to do. So I, I had a blast playing this. This will be a solid addition to my collection, and would be a solid addition to, frankly, anyone's um, solo collection, especially um, if, if you like those kind of narrative-driven games. If you like Silent Victory, if, if you like B-17, this puts you on the opposite side of B-17, which is so cool. Um, and it really, it, when, you've play, when you play it and you see what happens, you're like, okay, yeah. It's, this game is not just rolling through charts like B-17 is. You have a lot more choice and things to do, but the end effect is, I did my best and I still got hosed, <laughs> which is very B-17. <laughs> uh, so I, I highly recommend this game. Um, just, I'm a sucker for the Air War. This game was made for me, frankly. I love Jerry White's designs, and this is a really good one. Um, if you can pick this up, absolutely go ahead and do it. Um, this gets a big thumbs up from me, and I appreciate you hanging around and watching, and I've been Alexander from theplayersaid.com.